John Ricardo Irfan, Juan Kohl, je ugledni američki profesor sa Univerziteta u Michiganu. Profesor Kohl je i istaknuti naučnik blisko istočnih studija. U razgovoru za FACE profesor iznosi svoje mišljenje o sukobu Izraela i Palestine, ali i ostalim bitnim svjetskim temama. Izdajamo samo neke izjave. Sukob sa Bliskog istoka je regionalni i ne prijeti da se proširi na Balkan. Ipak to je u suprotnu od ovog mišljenja gospodina Čanka, da smo ipak već u ratu. Zatim kaže profesor Kohl, ono što bi se moglo proširiti je islamofobija zbog nesvatanja suštine vjere i islam i uloge poslanika Muhameda a.s. Inače, profesor Kohl je autor knjige o poslaniku Muhamedu. Kratak intervju sa dugim, jakim porukama i poukama. We are honored to be joined by Juan Kohl, a professor at Michigan University and a distinguished scholar in Middle Eastern studies. Today we're going to be having an insightful conversation about the region's complex dynamics and I want to wish you a very warm welcome here in Sarajevo. Well, thank you so much, Nikola. Okay, so uh, for starters, I want to talk a little bit about your book, Muhammad, A Prophet of Peace Amid the Clash of Empires. I want to know uh, what was particularly inspiring aspect of Muhammad before, um, before your research and writing a book about him. And what knowledge did you possess before all of that? Well, I'm a, a historian of the Middle East and I did graduate uh, work in early Islam. So I was trained in that field. And um, I was always interested in the biography of the, of the Prophet Muhammad. And I became increasingly distressed by the rise of Islamophobia in the West and by extremism in the Middle East, which it seemed to me distorted the view of the Prophet. How familiar is the world, especially the West, with the character of Muhammad, peace be upon him? Well, I think in, in uh, Europe and the United States, uh, the, uh, the biography of the Prophet Muhammad is very little known. And uh, I I instead, they think of him as a, a warrior chief, uh, not, not as so much of, as a prophet. And it's a very distorted view. Uh, what role does Islam play in, in these conflicts in the Middle East? And um, what is the Western perception of it? Mm -hmm. Well, the Western perception of it is, is, of course, various, but there's an increasingly disturbing view that Muslims are somehow inherently violent, uh, that Islam is a religion that sort of leads people to be violent. Uh, and it's a very dangerous point of view, and of course it results in a great deal of hatred of Muslims, of what we call Islamophobia. Yeah. Um, professor, might the current situation in the Middle East mark perhaps a beginning of World War III? Uh, well, no, I, I don't think it's to that extent. It's a regional conflict, uh, and I don't believe that, uh, uh, that we're on the verge of a, a, a greater war. But it, it certainly has the potential for expanding regionally, and, and that is very disturbing. Can it in any way affect our region here in the Balkans? What do you think? I think the main impact uh, on the Balkans would be, again, that uh, rise of Islamophobia. Uh, I think the, the, we just had a horrible incident in Chicago where a man killed uh, a little boy and, and, and stabbed his mother, uh, saying that uh, Muslims uh, uh, are evil and, and they don't have a right to live and, and so forth. And uh, so the, the, there's that kind of phenomenon, of the demonization of Muslims that comes out of something like what Hamas did. Yeah, is there any way we can, is there any way that um, Hamas and ISIS can be compared in a way that media, that certain media outlets and politicians suggest? Well, I think that uh, they, they are very different movements and Hamas is much more of an organic movement. It comes out of the Palestinian occupation. ISIS was a, a, a group of adventurers, basically. They didn't have strong grassroots. But what's disturbing is, in this most recent October 7th attack, Hamas did adopt some ISIL uh, type of tactics. And uh, uh, they are stupid tactics. I mean, just as a matter of strategy, mm -hmm. if you're a guerrilla movement, your only uh, advantage is that you can strike and then withdraw and hide. 
But if people know where you are, then they can come and get you. So uh, using these kinds of guerrilla tactics when you have a return address uh, is not only I mean, strategically incorrect, but it, it is stupid. Yeah, we can all agree. Is there, do you know, is there a single Middle Eastern country that could, um, that could mediate or exert pressure to end this conflict? I don't believe that there is uh, uh, any regional power that can, can end the, the conflict. I, certainly, I think behind the scenes, uh, Egypt and Saudi Arabia are, uh, and Turkey are, are all working uh, to resolve things. Uh, but the United States is backing Israel to the hilt. It, it's sending uh, aircraft carriers and uh, even instructed the, the U.S. diplomats not to talk about de-escalation. As long as the U.S. is backing it, then I think, you know, it's the superpower. Yeah, so the U.S. is the one we rely on. They can end this conflict. This I war. think if, if Mr. Biden asked the Israelis to stand down, that he could exert enormous pressure on them. But so far, that doesn't seem to be the uh, position of Washington. I think people in the United States were shocked by what uh, Hamas did, uh, the images of uh, attacking those civilians at the music festival and uh, the rumors of atrocities. Uh, and I think there's a real sense of, of wanting to wipe Hamas out as an organization. And so the attitude is they should do whatever they need to do uh, to, to dismantle Hamas, but they don't understand that you can't dismantle Hamas without uh, harming large numbers of innocent non-combatants, which is a war crime. When can we expect this to end? What do you think? It's unclear. Uh, it, it seems to me that it could be weeks. You know, first of all, if the Israelis do go into uh, Gaza, they're going to find it hard going. It could be large numbers of Israeli casualties, Israeli military casualties. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's a small place. Uh, uh, how long would they need to, to accomplish their military objectives? Uh, so uh, it, it's, it's a little unclear now exactly what they're planning to do, but they did clear North Gaza. It does seem like they intend to invade it. Uh, but that may not go smoothly for them. From the current situation, is it possible to, to um, talk about the two-state solution between Israel and Palestine? Can we open that conversation again? There hasn't been a possibility of a two-state solution for decades. Uh, I think the Oslo Accords of 1993 were the last time it was plausible. And uh, the Israelis are mainly responsible for having derailed the Oslo peace process, mm -hmm. and in particular, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu mm -hmm. has boasted about derailing the Oslo process. Mm -hmm. in the, they promised to withdraw from Palestinian lands in 1993. In the next 10 years, they doubled the number of Israeli settlers on Palestinian lands. So that's not a withdrawal. And then they didn't withdraw. Uh, so since, I would say, about 2000, there's no possibility of a two-state solution. What is the so solution? Do you have any idea? Well, there are three possibilities. Uh, one is that Israel and Palestine would become the same state. It would be a multi-ethnic state, like Bosnia itself. Uh, another possibility is continued apartheid. The Palestinians would remain stateless and without rights uh, under Israeli sovereignty. That's not a long-term sustainable mm -hmm prospect that mm -hmm. it could happen for a long time. Uh, and the third possibility is that ethnic cleansing, that the Palestinians simply should be removed by the Israelis, transferred to Jordan and Egypt and so forth. And uh, uh, like 1948, another what is called a Nakba or a, a, yeah. a catastrophe for mm. the Palestinians. Well, we are all hoping that the first case scenario is the one that will prevail. And thank you so much, Professor. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Nesla.